Hi everyone, today I will show you how to web scrape an entire database. So instead of just manually copying information from a web page and then storing it in a spreadsheet of some sort, today we will write a program that does it for us, automatically. And this comes extra handy when dealing with frequently updated data, such as weather forecasts or maybe housing market prices and things of that sort. So in this tutorial, we will use a library called Mechanical Soup for the scraping and we will then combine it with an SQLite database. So are you ready? Let's do this. Now, in my case, I want to copy this entire table from Wikipedia. And since I want to do it efficiently, I will only copy the URL and I will tackle everything else with Python. So we will start a brand new Python document. I'm calling it scraper.py. You can name it in whichever way you'd like. And we will paste the URL which is copied as a comment, at least at first. And as usual, we will begin with the imports. So we will first import mechanical soup, which is our web scraping library. And then we will import pandas as PD, which will help us with organizing the data we scraped. And then lastly, we will also import SQLite 3, which will help us with the database. Now, if it's the first time you're using these libraries, you will also need to install them. So we will navigate to our terminal and we can install them with pip install mechanical soup and then pip install pandas. Perfect. And now we can use these libraries inside our project. Okay, now let's start scraping. To do this, we will first create a browser object by typing mechanical soup.stateful browser in camel case and we will assign this expression to browser and now we can use this browser object to open any url we'd like we will simply type browser dot open and then inside the round brackets we will paste the url we copied from earlier and we will do this inside a set of strings we can now get rid of this comment from earlier and we have full access to this web page we are looking to target. And not only this, but we can also select specific elements from this page. Let me show you how. And we will begin by looking at the code. So let's open the developer tools by pressing on Control Shift C. We will scroll slightly below and we will click on the first row item of our table. Once we do that, we can see that it's a TH element. There you go, that's the TH tag with the class attribute of table RH. Now let's quickly double check if the rest of our distribution names are also matching this description. So let's click on this select button and we will click on the second row value of our distribution column. We can see that once again, it's a TH element also with the class of table RH. Perfect. We can now use these attributes to select our entire column of distribution names. We can extract all the table elements from the first column with the following command. We will type browser.page.findAll and then inside the round brackets, we will first specify the name of the tag, which is th, table header, followed by the specific attributes which we would like to target. In our case, that would be the class attribute with the value of table rh. And we can assign this search command to let's call it th, according to the tag name. Now, the only problem is, is that this command will return the entire tag, including the tags themselves, along with all the attributes, which is way too much information. The only thing we're actually interested at is the text that lives inside this tag name. So let's dispose of anything else besides the text. Now, in the next line of code, we will simply use a list comprehension, one of my favorite things to do, where we would like to keep the value dot text for value in th. And we will then assign this list comprehension, let's call it distribution. So this command is basically selecting all the tags and this command is focusing only on the text of those tags. Now let's go ahead and print the results. Let's run it. Actually, let's save <laughs> our file first. Thank you for reminding me. Awesome, so we got lots of elements in return, but the only problem is they all include the new line character. So let's go ahead and dispose of it before we move on. So back in our list comprehension, instead of just typing value.text, we will add a .replace command, 
where every instance of backslash n, aka new line character, will be replaced by an empty string. We can now save this code, we can rerun it, and everything looks much, much better. But let's quickly see if all the values that we wanted to select were actually selected. So our list begins with Alma Linux and moves on with Alpine Linux. And then when we scroll to the very bottom, we see that it ends with Ubuntu and Ututu. So let's go back to Wikipedia and check if it's the same. Cool, so our table indeed starts with Alma Linux, moves on with Alpine Linux, and when we scroll, we should see Ubuntu Tutu. No, we see Zorin OS. Hmm. Ah, okay, there's more than just one table on this page. And if we scroll to the very bottom of all these tables, we should find, yeah, Ubuntu Ututu. Cool, so what happened is instead of selecting only a single table, we have selected all the distribution names from all the tables. So let's fix it. So one way we can do this is to search for the index value of Zorin OS inside our list, and then we will just slice off all the items that follow it, because we don't need them. Now to find out the index value of a list item, we will first specify the name of the list, distribution, followed by index, and then the name of the item we're searching for, Zorin OS. We will save this file, we will rerun it, and boom, looks like our item is located on index 94. So let's slice off the rest of the items from our distribution list. So we will simply reassign distribution to distribution, including all the items up until index 95, which will include Zorin OS, index 94, and skip the rest of the values. Now let's go ahead and print this new distribution list. We will save this file, we will rerun it. So as expected, it begins with Alma Linux, and then it ends, oh, I'm blocking it with Zorin OS. Perfect, awesome. Now let's extract the rest of the columns. So once again, we will press on Control Shift C, but this time we will click on the first item of the founders column, which happens to be a TD element table data. Now it looks like there are no special attributes associated with this element, but the good news are the rest of the column values have the exact same characteristics. So selecting them will be extra simple, but then organizing is a completely different thing. But luckily I already figured out a very simple solution to it. So you'll see it soon. To extract all the table data elements, we will type browser.page.find all, but this time we will only pass the tag name, which is TD. Now we will assign this expression to TD. And since once again, we receive the entire tag, which we're not interested at, we will copy this list comprehension from above and we will apply it on our TD list as well. So we will change distribution to columns. We will select a different name and we will change the age to TD, of course. And let's quickly make sure that we are only selecting the values we need. So our list starts with Alma Linux Foundation. Let's copy this item. And it ends ah, with active, which is way too common to select. So let's see what's the next value. Okay, binary blobs. That's less common than active. So let's go back to our code and we'll find out the index of these values. So first we will print columns dot index and we will paste Alma Linux Foundation. Next we will print columns dot index but this time of binary blobs with a capital B otherwise it's not gonna work. So let's go ahead and save it and let's run this file. Cool so our data begins at index 6 and it ends at index 1051. So let's go ahead and reassign columns to equal columns starting from index 6 up until 1051. Let's go ahead and quickly print it just to double check that everything is correct. Awesome, so the beginning is correct. We get Alma Linux Foundation, but let's see the end. Awesome, the end is active. That's exactly what we wanted. Perfect, so now we have extracted all the data we need, but how exactly do we organize it? Here's one solution. Let's count all the disorganized columns that we have. 
So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So altogether, we have 11 disorganized columns. We're not really interested in distribution because we already organized it. So here's a solution. What if we select every 11th item in our list, and then we can get the entire founder column? Then we can dispose of the very first item in our list and to make the next item take the lead instead of it. And then we can again extract every 11th element from our list and we can get the entire maintainer column. We then dispose again of the first value in our list and we move on to the release year. From here, if we select every 11th item, we are extracting the entire, we are getting the entire release year column and so on. Now, in order to select every 11th item in a list, we will simply type the name of the list, columns, followed by a slicing command, and then a double colon and 11. And that's it. This is how we get the entire column of founders. Now, the next column is almost just as easy. We will type columns, we will dispose of the first item in a list by slicing it off. So we will start from index one up until the very end, and we will then add another slicing command with a double colon and 11. That's it. For the next column, we will do almost the same thing, but this time we will start from index two. Now we can already start to see a pattern. So let me just make it a bit more clear. So saying columns is exactly like saying columns starting from index zero up until the very end. So now the pattern is 100% clear and I bet you guys already know how we're gonna tackle it. Now the fastest way to do it is to copy all the column names and we will organize them in a nice list. Now I've done this off camera because, well, it's easy enough. And I've started from the founder column because we will take care of the distribution column separately. Now, another thing I've done is I replaced every instance of space with an underscore, just will make things easier. And if you guys don't want to type everything, if you don't want to organize all this data in a list, just copy this list from the description. Cool. Now let's organize all the data we've extracted in a really nice dictionary. So let's scroll below. It will start a new dictionary where our first key would be distribution and it will carry the value of our distribution list from earlier. We will then assign this expression to, let's call it dictionary. And we will then use a for loop to insert the rest of the keys and their values. So right below, we will type for index key in enumerate column names. Now, if you guys are not familiar with enumerate, it basically helps us count the iterations. So for the key of founder, we will receive the index of zero. For the key of maintainer, we will receive the index of one, which is perfect because if you look at our organizing commands, the column of founder starts from index zero, while the column of maintainer starts from index one. So this command makes our lives so much easier. And then inside the for loop, we will create a new dictionary key for each of our column names. Let's first use a template and then we can fill it with the actual iteration variables. And we will then assign this key to columns starting from a certain index up until the very end of the list. And we will focus only on the 11th value values. And we can then replace founder with key, which represents each of our column names one at a time. And we can then replace index zero with index which is our iteration variable given by the enumerate function. And that's it. That's all we need to do to organize these enormous amounts of data into a proper dictionary. But because it's a bit hard to view a dictionary, let's convert this dictionary into a pandas data frame. We can do this by typing df data frame and assigning it to pd.dataframe, where the data would be our dictionary. Now let's go ahead and print this data frame. Oh, but we don't really see all the columns because I'm zooming in too much. Let's see if we only print the first five values, maybe we can uh, have a better look. Awesome, so we do get a bit more information this way. And if you want to check for the last values, just type tail. Let's do it again. Make sure it ends with Zorin OS. And yep, it does end with Zorin OS. Good job, you guys. Now let's go ahead and organize it inside a database. 
Now we've already learned how to do it in the previous SQLite tutorial, but there was just one command that I missed, so let's do it again, no problem. So we will begin by establishing a connection. We will call it connection, and we will assign it to SQLite3.connect, and then inside the round brackets, we will select a name for our database, in my case, Linux distro.db. And since we have established a connection, we also need to close it. So we will type connection, that closed. Now in between we will need a cursor object so we can pass SQL commands to it. So we will type cursor equals connection dot cursor and we can then go ahead and create our very first database table. To do this we will type cursor dot execute and then inside the round brackets we will begin passing SQL. So we will create a table called Linux where the first column would be distribution. And then we don't really have time to type the rest of the column names because we already have a ready list of them. We just need to concatenate it. So what we will do is we will add an additional string with the closing brackets because we have opened it here and we need to make sure it's closed. And then in between, we will concatenate our list of column names, but in a string form. To do this, we will use a connecting character of a comma to which we will add the join method where we pass our column names. And that's pretty much how it looks like. And it's just a really good way to save us some typing. Now to insert our data into this table, we will use a slightly different command from the last time. So for i in range, the length of our data frame, we will do cursor.execute and we will insert into our Linux table values in the form of a tuple with 12 different items represented by question marks. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, <laughs> nine 10, 11, 12. 12, followed by the actual data we would like to insert, which in our case is data frame.iloc representing the rows in the index of i, which is our iteration variable from above. And then once we have finished inserting all this data into our table, we will need an additional command, which I've missed in the previous tutorial. So it goes as follows. It's connection.commit. And this command is very important because it permanently saves all this data we have inserted inside the database file. Without it, our table data will disappear as soon as this file finished running, which is awful. And the only reason why we didn't notice it in the previous tutorial was because we used the exact same file both to create the database and both to select from it, which is something that never happens in real life. It only happens in, you know, demonstrational tutorials and things of that sort. So my apologies for not catching it earlier. And thank you so much to Mark for pointing this out. Now let's go ahead and run this code and see exactly how our database is being created and exactly how it looks like inside. Boom, there you go, there's our database. And this time, there's a little bit of gibberish, yeah, but at least we can recognize some proper English words, which is something that we couldn't do in the previous tutorial. So if you're only getting gibberish in return, if you only have those question marks and those squares, probably that means that you've missed something inside your code just like I've missed something in mine. Now in this tutorial, we've learned a very efficient way of creating databases. But how exactly do we combine these databases with our application? That's exactly what I will show you in the next tutorial. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you found it helpful. And if you did, please share it with the world. You can also leave me a like, you can leave me a comment, you can subscribe to my channel and turn on the notification bell. And of course, stay tuned for the next episode. I'll see you guys soon. Thank you so much for watching.